<laughs> All right. How's it going, everybody? Thank you for being here. Uh, I'll make a few introductions and then we'll get right into this panel. All right. So I'm Matt German Prey. Uh, I am a professor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. So you now know somebody from Nebraska for the comic. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> There aren't many of us. Uh, and then I'm also one of the co-founders of the Chaos Project, which is a project that focuses on the health and sustainability of the open source projects that you might care about, whether you're running them yourself or depending on them, whatever it might be. Uh, and that started about seven years ago and we are a Linux Foundation project. And I'm joined by Don Foster here on my left, who is the Chaos Director of Data Science. She's been with the Chaos Project for about a year and Don, I'll have you introduce yourself a little bit beyond that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Don Foster. I am uh, currently working full time for the Chaos Project on data science. I've been doing this open source thing for 20 plus years. So I've worked at, at companies like uh, Intel, VMware, uh, Puppet, various places. So I've worked in, I've worked in some OSPOs, I've worked in some community roles, and I have a deep passion for metrics and measuring open source project health. Thank you, Don. Uh, and next to Don is Gary White. Uh, Gary joins us from Verizon and is also uh, one of the people who has, well, not one of, probably the person who has led a lot of the conversation around viability. So that's why we're here today. So Gary, you wanna introduce yourself a bit? Hello, I'm Gary White. I work for Verizon's open source program office, uh, focused on, surprise, open source software viability. Uh, that's Dirk, that's my boss over there. Hi, Dirk. Um, I had to point you out in the crowd. Uh, I work with Chaos uh, through the metrics, me metrics and Metrics Models Working Group, and I co-chair the OSPO Working Group with Don. Uh, these models are alive basically because those working groups exist, so I owe a debt of gratitude to the people who helped me build them. Thank you, Gary. And at the end is Emma Irwin, and I have known Emma for quite a while uh, while she was at Mozilla, and I've learned so much about open source uh, from Emma, so thank you for that, Emma. Uh, and so thanks for being here from Microsoft. And Emma, you want to give us a little sure. about yourself? Yeah, thank you. And I have been to Omaha. It's a really nice city, actually. Um, so yeah, my name is Emma. I work, I work at Microsoft on the Open Source Programs Office. I've been there for about three and a half years. Um, before that, I was at Mozilla, been working in open source. I'll say 20 plus as well. <laughs> kind of captures it. Um, my focus is on a lot of things, so viability covers a lot of things when you're thinking about open source. I'm always especially interested in the teaching angle of things, how to help people take metrics and understand them in the context of whatever they're trying to achieve. And that's all I can think to say. That is excellent. All right, well, and thanks to everybody for being here. So we'll, you know, I'll start it out. I'm gonna moderate this and I have a series of questions. We go till about 12.30, right? Kind of at half past. And we'll definitely try to leave time for questions from the audience. So the first one is, is why is it important to assess the viability of an open source project when selecting one to use? And are there some cases where viability is more or less important to assess? So you know, why do we care about viability and are there cases where it's more or less important to assess? Gary, you're holding the mic, so. I, I did that on purpose, I wanted to start. <laughs> um, we care about viability because there's not really a standard framework for assessing risk in software. There's a lot of approaches that people informed in the open source community might take, uh, depending on your familiarity with the project, if you're familiar, if you know that the governance board is great, if you know the community is really good but none of that was being captured in a standardized way with any kind of metrics that were quantitative. And I wanna focus on the fact that it is quantitative. There are qualitative things that you can't capture very well that viability isn't suited for. But um, that's like the motivation of why we try to capture with viability and that's been the direction that we've taken so far. Uh, yeah, I'll hand off and let somebody else. Yeah, to address the other part of the question, which is um, you know places where it's maybe more or less important. The way the way I like to think about viability is maybe from a more like strategic projects perspective. So if you're building your product on top of a particular open source technology and it's really really important to your products, 
then assessing viability is going to be absolutely critical. On the other hand, if it's a very, very tiny library that you could maybe easily rewrite, uh, maybe viability is, is less important because it's maybe not as critical to your, to your product. Now, that's not to say that you don't want to assess you know, security and things like that as part of viability, but it's maybe not as critical as, you know, because you can't replace a Kubernetes, right, once you've built your product on top of it, whereas, a, you know, a teeny tiny maybe math library where you're using a function or two, you could probably replace that. Emma, you have thoughts? Um, I was just listening, trying to th um, think. So, I mean, I think viability is something that you use, you, the metrics specifically for selecting open source project, but there's also a couple of questions I have. You know, if those viability metrics don't meet, you know, a certain criteria, then what? Like, what if it is the Kubernetes? And I think that's where, like I mentioned, the teaching people is like, how can you, for example, work with like Alpha Omega to um, address some of the like security, take advantage of the work they're doing. So there's kind of that question, what if not? And then also just it's something to revisit and what does that look like to evaluate ongoing? How does that scale? There's just, I have sometimes more questions than answers. So maybe could you talk a little bit about how each of you understands viability? That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a good. That's a good question. I mean, I think of it in the sense of the metrics model that Chaos works on, uh, as part of the working group. I also think of it as a capability that we try and build in our engineers um, across the company and understanding what, you know, we we encourage the use of open source, um, but how to think about it from, you know, the lens of, of, um, you know, are there vulnerabilities? Is there is there just one maintainer, like th th those types of things? So I think of viability as, as those metrics, but also um, behavioral, I guess. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think um, I, I have a couple of frames of reference for viability because uh, moderately selfishly for Verizon, I think a lot about viability in, as being a complement to what you might do for license compliance and vulnerability scanning as part of a standard software development lifecycle. You likely already have some systems in place that say these vulnerabilities exist, these licensing problems exist. You may address those separately from where you're looking at the viability model to get more metrics about what chaos tracks as a community health uh, metrics organization. You get more in-depth information about governance policies or what the activity on the project has been recently versus in the past and what that trend looks like. And you can make decisions about uh, if there's a new project you want to integrate, does that like cut the mustard against all of the other projects that are already in your applications? And so I think of it uh, in that moderately selfish tone, but also uh, expanding into the chaos space of like using those metrics to get a better understanding of the overall community in a particular ecosystem. Yeah, and I agree with b uh, what both of them have said. And then just to kind of build on that, I think the other way to look at it is from a customer perspective, right? So if you're including all of these open source projects in your products as a company, you want to best serve your customer. So you want to make sure that, you know, you don't have critical security vulnerabilities in some of these dependencies. You want to make sure that a project isn't going to go away tomorrow and that you are going to be able to sustain your use of that project over over time in your product. So, uh, you know, I look at viability as a way to better serve your customers as an organization. Right. So have you all seen the impacts of projects that are no longer viable or, or fail, that whether it's within your own organization or even these further downstream impacts with customers? Yeah, I mean, I, I can give an example. I mean, there was the Elasticsearch relicensing, uh, for example. And so, you know, most of us at companies were, were struggling with, with what to do with that. You know, now you would kind of replace it with open search, but at the time, the Amazon was just starting to spin that up and it really wasn't, it itself wasn't a viable replacement for, for Elasticsearch. So it came down to, you know, a decision of, do we, do we build something? Do we try to find a replacement? Because there really wasn't a drop-in replacement. Um, or do we just, do we end up, you know, sucking it up and buying some licenses because we've already incorporated this thing and we frankly don't have much choice. 
So I think that was that was a case where viability, I think, hit a lot of us within companies um, pretty quickly and unexpectedly. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm going to come back to the qualitative versus quantitative idea where there's a lot of qualitative things that open source technologists, and I'm sure much of us in the room look at a project and go, mm, I'm not sure I want to use that version, or mm, you know, there hasn't been a commit in like 10 months, so maybe I don't want to use this project. But sometimes that's really hard to communicate to people who don't interest themselves with how open source works or don't interest themselves with how they might want to use software more reliably and less risky. And putting some metrics behind that so that you can do an apples to apples comparison has been like, I think, the best impact that we've gotten from it so far. I'm not sure if I have anything to add to, to that, although I do have something to add to the apples to apples. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think it's it's really interesting. Some of the the work, and actually tomorrow, just a pitch for my colleague um, James and also uh, Remy from um, forgetting his organization, but they're doing a talk tomorrow on repository cohorts, and that's all about grouping repositories or projects according to a set of characteristics. And I think that that's getting at um, the apples to apples thing there, because it, you know, just comparing all the projects to each other, or you know, according to one set of metrics, like. That's super hard, but if you have, you know, if you look at characteristics that are important, maybe it's the usage number, maybe it's um, which products it's used in, maybe it's, you know, there's lots of different things. Um, but I think that's really, there's something really important there to learn, keep learning. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like um, I know Remy uses this idea of project maturity. And I like the framing of a maturity model because it gives you stages to do to improve. But I also like viability for the fact that it doesn't quite have that. It doesn't quite say, do this and your numbers will improve. It's more about how the project is performing without the analysis. Like, I don't know. I think maturity is intended to kind of bring you along a path and uh, it feels like more of an observation with the metrics model that we have right now. Okay. So kind of leaning into that, um, so in the chaos project, we develop metrics. We've kind of been alluding to metrics, kind of it's these, these atomic measures of things. The most common one is like age of an issue, for example. But we develop metric models, which are a collection of metrics that might give you a better idea about something to which viability is one of the metric models. Um, so uh, lots of times people don't quite understand where to even begin in terms of, of how to understand a particular issue, whether it's responsiveness of a community or, say, viability of, of a project. So where would you even begin to understand the viability of a project? Yeah, so I wrote uh, four huge metrics models. All of them have eight metrics in them, and there's three blog posts. Uh, and then Don was like, that's a little much. Can you give me a metrics model that has four metrics in it and so I gave her one that has six <laughs> and that that was as far as I got up. Could you talk about what those are? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, the, the reasoning behind it was that I wanted to have something that was reason as comprehensive as I could possibly get it with the metrics that were in chaos. Uh, I actually had um, I'll share this now because it's not such a heart attack. I had a uh, Google Doc internally that had something like 85 metrics that I sorted through. And then I went, these ones are the best ones, and those are the ones that wound up making it into uh, like this four-part governance, strategy, community, and compliance and security model. And then the smaller version of that is intended to like give you some indicators and get you started with the idea to see what value you can get out of it. Uh, but if you have interest, just I want to know what the community is like for all of my projects, then it's good to start with the community model and so on and so on. And I think, too, one of the things to look at with, with viability is um, educating your developers. So I think in a lot of cases, the reason we end up in some of the situations we end up in is because open source is so easy to use, right? I can just import that package and, and start using it and ship it. Um, and you know, individual engineers and developers don't always don't always think about the long-term impacts of of some of their decisions. You know, we 
I had a situation at a company where this, this poor team had spent months doing this technical evaluation of this component that they were going to include in their product. And they sent it to us for kind of a last look, and they were like, yeah, it's GPL, it's fine, you know, whatever. And um, it wasn't, it was AGPL. And we aren't allowed to ship AGPL um, products for that, that company because we have some customers that won't take it if it has AGPL code in it. So that was a non-starter. And this poor engineering team had spent months evaluating this technical solution that they just were never gonna be allowed to use. So I think you know, educating people that you know, coming to your OSPO if you have one, or you know, thinking about some of these dependencies a little bit, a little bit harder before you incorporate them into your products. Emma, do you have? You're saying so many smart things. I don't know. Um, I mean, so the question was like, how do you use them or how do you introduce them? Like what would there? be the things you would look for to understand the viability of a project? Well, I'll kind of share maybe a little bit of how we're, we're starting to do that. Um, I don't know if it's, it's exactly the metrics model, um, but we do have something called a component intelligence. We have an internal a page that basically you can select by um, package, so like PyPy or NuGet, and a project, and then we're working to bring in data from the ecosystem uh, using um, GitHub data, but also ecosystem dot, I'm forgetting the exact um, URL, which tells a story, tells basically a story of, of that package. So if there's any critical vulnerabilities, um, if there's a risk to uh, the sustainability, which are using a, a couple of community metrics, right, like activity and um, and a few other things, so we're we're kind of encouraging people to look at that when they because we often get part of the reason we did that was because we get often you know people what open source can I use like this big giant question um, and you know asking people to step back a little bit more and, and, and ask themselves what what is it that you need and you know, what else is being used at Microsoft so that you, know, you can maybe talk to somebody. Um, and here's here's our component intelligence dashboard so you can look at, you know, maybe some of the flags and we try and we're experimenting with using color. So like there's a red, <laughs> you know, it's not that, you know, it's still uh, up to you to go in and, and look at, but uh, just trying to help people that way. So that's how we're approaching it one way. Okay, so this is a, kind of a follow-up question to that. And this is also kind of a question for the audience to just kind of reflect on yourself. Um, you know, beyond, say, a, a license being a, a non-starter or a project, an upstream project being, like, loaded with critical vulnerabilities, <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, those are fine. Those are pretty clear <laughs> indicators that this may not work. Yeah. Are, there, are there other things that you would look at that you and this is again for the audience, that you would kind of look at a project and, and just think, this isn't gonna happen. This just isn't gonna work. So I, yeah, so just, I see a hand that went up right away. <laughs> so <laughs> you can save that a little bit, but we'll come back to that. But I'm curious what the panel thinks too. Yeah, um, yeah. so those are no starters. Yeah, we do have processes for licensing and compliance, so I tend to talk less about those. Um, I mean, there's there's some, I think, in the model around issue queues, like just taking a look at what the backlog looks like, you know, uh, how often a maintainer is responding and, um, yeah, just the general, acti the traffic, honestly, because um, that's not moving. But I don't think that's necessarily a non-starter. It's, it's something then we more teach, like, okay, so, you know, um, and we have a, we recently had a blog post today again. I'm pitching all our things, but um, that has like a a wheel that to go through questions to ask. And the, the first one is, you know, what what are your goals? Um, and, you know, and what are your resources? And if you're if something that you want is to open issues and pull requests, and you you're recognizing that there is a a resource issue, do you have are you able to 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 contribute that to the project? Right. So it's not a non-starter necessarily. It's like um, just being strategic about how you think about use beyond yes or no, like uh, it's it's more it's more strategic, which is Don often says stuff like that. Yeah, I um, totally agree with the approach that we don't give a prescriptive yes no. Uh, we try to give like a spectrum of answers based on the language ecosystem, based on what uh, the metrics come back as in a gradient, not just by themselves, if this number is 30, then we won't let you use it. That's really bad. Uh, we try to aggregate more things together so that we can say, 
uh, we don't recommend using this, and if you decide to use it anyway, then you're assuming the risk that we have already told you about. And so if you can assume that risk because this package is really that critically important to you, then that's a negotiation that you can do internally of your like department. But uh, trying to think about it in terms of like giving indicators and giving a spectrum of options because then maybe they look at another project and they see, oh, well, the OSPO does recommend this one. So maybe that's better for me because now I don't have to have the argument with my boss about my number's bad and my thing is red on the big indicator, so I don't want to deal with that. Yeah, and I, I really like the the approach of looking at it from a, from a risk perspective because the other piece that I think you need to look at is how might I be able to mitigate these risks? So, you know, if it's, a, if it's a single maintainer or if it's dominated by a single organization, can you get some of your employees into this community and get some other people involved to help mitigate some of that risk? Um, and then there are risks you might not be able to mitigate. And those, those I think, are more on the showstopper categories. But, you know, incredibly toxic communities, for example, where people are just awful to each other, um, you know, maybe, maybe that's a non-starter because you... you in a lot of cases, if that community doesn't improve at some point, um, there's a high likelihood that it'll eventually implode. And you can't fix that. So there, there was one hand that went up in terms of non-starters as well. Can you, I'm gonna ask you to just hold your response to that just from a microphone perspective <laughs> to like get the, I'll stop in just a second, but if you could share that, I mean, we would love to hear what, what the non-starters are for you as well. Um, and, and we are on the last, I'm on the last question now, so we'll, we'll get out to the audience here r real, what's that? I said finally. Finally, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you talk about um, assessing viability and helping people within an organization understand uh, how to, to understand that viability of the projects that they're engaging with. Um, but at places like, like Microsoft and at places like Verizon, there are, a really a lot of developers. And so these, sometimes I would imagine these one-on-one -on -one conversations with the developers is really challenging. So how do you, how do you get this message across and be part of that conversation within your organizations to, to reflect on viability? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I couldn't pass this microphone right now if I tried. Um, I, I think it's, it's a lot of, uh, the part of being an OSPO that isn't about the technology at that point. It's, it's that uh, I mentioned a lot that the quantitative part is why viability is something that I'm really like happy about and excited to use. But this is the part where a lot of qualitative and people skills come into it, where you pick battles, you say, this is more important than this other thing. And there are, um, I think, Emma, as you mentioned, there are projects that it, it doesn't matter if it doesn't quite fit the viability metrics model that like we're not going to get rid of some really big project that's used across every single team in the company. So what can we do instead to think about it differently or find a way to interpret metrics so that we can identify risk and that we can inform people about how to do it, but doing that with empathy and doing that in a way that's not like, I don't know, the teacher hitting your hand with a ruler because you did something wrong, right? Um, yeah. Thanks. So it's like open source competence at scale is kind of the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so beyond the systems that we have, you know, to kind of flag licenses and all those, those types of things, um, I will say, I mean, I think there's an education perspective, but I also think like there's a, tr you know, an empowerment piece for, you know, who, you know, is building software in your company and, you know, helping them surface the questions that they need to ask and feel like they can ask things because sometimes people are nervous or um, rather, th uh, so I would just say there's that empowerment piece, communication channels, um, because as one example in a communication channel, you know, someone was asking, you know, we can't get this maintainer to like respond and should we fork it? And, and just the fact that they felt like they could ask that question and were able to help them not fork it um, is what I can think about. I mean, I think, I think we're always struggling because, you know, you educate and empower, but then you have new people starting and it's just a, it's a continual process. So I think um, experimentation is one, instead of trying to think of it as like one big 
problem to solve or is to like just take ideas and experiment with them and learn from them and, and keep moving them on, I think is what I would say. There's no real cut and dry answer. Thank you. Yeah, and Don. Yeah, and the one thing that, that I would add to it is, you know, you, as an OSPO, you are never going to be able to answer everyone's questions one on one, right? You have to think about you have to think about scale. And we you know one of the things that, you know, Dirk drove when he was in uh, VMware's OSPO was a really, really robust best practice um, section of, of the website. So, you know, internally we had all of these documents that that people could look at where we had you know, if, if this is happening, this is what you should do. You know, here's some guidance about licensing. We had guidance about all kinds of things that people could just sort of self-service. And the beauty of this was we also had an internal Slack channel where a lot of times it wasn't necessarily OSPO saying, here, read the link about the, the thing. It was other people in other business units who had encountered that thing and found our best practice document or guide on that particular topic. And they'd be like, oh, well, you should read you know, this, this link. And so, so that's, I think, how you kind of scale an OSPO and you, know, you build the viability pieces into, into all of that. Plus one good docs. Good, good docs, yeah. All right, so we have about 10 minutes. So if we go back to that question, right, what are the like alarms that, <laughs> that might make you wonder about viability? Maybe we could, there was an individual in the back and I see you right here. A lot of hands too on, were you also gonna comment on the like things that, okay, fair enough, um, I got a few. Hi, I'm hi. Natalie Vlatko, I work for the OSPO at Cisco. Um, and while not a complete non-starter, but something that gives uh, me pause is um, single dominant vendor in an open source project. Um, we see a lot of the relicensing re going on as a possible part of that. But I think in terms of viability, we definitely want to think about how willing are we as a company, team, group, whatever, are we to contribute back to the project as part of its viability? How willing are we to be kind of clawing away from some of that single vendor stuff so that we can contribute and use and, and, and give back. And I think that's something that we often talk about viability is how good is this project to use? And part of the, the, the answer should be how worthwhile is it to contribute back as part of that viability too. And so single vendor is something that's, that can be a bit scary with that as well, okay. <laughs> with decision making. But at the same time, big shout out to foundations who make that decision very easy because they take that part of it away for the most part, and I think that's that's really cool. Great, thank you. There's Jack, Josh right here, so maybe, and then we got you in the back too. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> with a specific metric, I actually wanted to raise the issue because, so Josh Burkus, Red Hat OSPO, um, I also worked on CNCF dev stats, um, and so I already have sort of direct experience trying to construct a viability model. And what I thought I was hamstrung by is the sort of metrics I wanted the most were things that were extremely hard to measure, right? Um, extremely hard to collect data for, like things like, for example, more than the number of maintainers, I wanted to know the number of active maintainers and how many of them worked for a single company that might be in an unstable financial situation. Because that is in fact like one of the things that I've seen that has caused a project to go from being a dependency to a crisis. Um, and um, so um, are you looking at anything to try to infer some of this, these bits of data that might be extremely hard to collect? Yeah, I can uh, speak to that very specifically. Uh, something that we thought about a lot uh, in terms of being able to use the project past the point that you integrate it is the community and the governance. And I think uh, now called Lottery Factor, used to be called Bus Factor, as well as uh, Elephant Factor, uh, were pretty good indicators of like a leading piece of that, where if just one or two organizations is doing 80 to 90% of the contributions, that means if anything happens to that organization, it's just like, you know, lots of things can happen. So it's more reliable to use something with a higher elephant or bus factor generally. Like, it doesn't completely solve it, but it gives some indication that helps you mitigate that issue. Um, 
I'm sort of nodding. I would just say that when I mentioned the component intelligence, we do have like, we are looking at the kind of single maintainer um, situation, tr trying to also create like a metric around, we're calling the Nebraska metric, no offense, um, to like kind of look at like what that means, like in your dependency tree, like it's not just like, it's not just the project you're using, but the dependencies of that project that you're using and kind of trying to look at the whole, whole big picture. Sorry. Hi. Thank you for talk. Uh, great talk. And uh, I actually ran a similar project um, program actually to assess the um, project viability, measuring the project viability to sort of manage the risk management of each uh, project. And uh, just curious, uh, because I did the similar activity, um, I'd like to ask probably Gary and Emma how you, two questions. Uh, first, how, so you measure the project viability and you know the factors and you do the feedback and do you do the follow-up and how often, you know, how often do you uh, follow up and how do you make sure the project viability is improving? And the second question is that if the project viability is depending on the external community because each open source project, you don't have a full control, it's run by communities. So I'm just wondering if that is really depend on the external uh, community um, contributors, then how, you, how do you sort of uh, encourage the project to improve the viability? Thank you. Um, so um, I think on the influencing, like having a seat at the table kind of thing is, the language that I'm using, that me I'm using, a not really like a specific strategy to think about, you know, if you, if there's influence that you want to see in an open source project, having a seat at the table means being a contributor, or it might mean like being on the board of, uh, or part of the governance structure, not like as a shoulder to shoulder, first of all, <laughs> like seat of the table, you know, it's not to change things, but to, to try and like work shoulder to shoulder with the people that are, that are working on that projects. Um, you know, there's, um, there's a really interesting, uh, there's a project uh, that started out of Microsoft called Babylon JS, and they were exactly like that with their community. Um, I mean, it's a dependency for many projects, but um, there was a point where Microsoft wanted to, to put in, I think it was like a telemetry thing, um, and they proposed it, they, the, and the community said no, and so, no. <laughs> so it's also accepting what the community wants, uh, I think is the, the one thing I would say there. Um, I'll just leave it. Yeah. Sure, so I think um, just going back to the two questions, there's the question of uh, how are you assessing and are you checking in and what's the interval there? And then the second piece is uh, like, how do you do that and, and what's the results that you're driving? I think that for the first part, uh, it- The second, second question, maybe I can be more clear. So sure. the project opens, um, open source project viability depends on the uh, community and right. also the project. And then not all projects are run by your company. So there right. are lots of uh, projects you're just participating. In, and mm -hmm. then if you want to improve that viability of that project, then you won't have a full control. So ju just wondering how you actually do that. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so the first part was addressed. I'll do the second part of um, like, we haven't had this engagement with this model in that way. It kind of feels like more of a maturity thing of getting to a certain threshold. We usually just go with alternatives um, and try to find things that are similar but not at that same threshold of the project that's problematic. So I know that's kind of like a non-answer, but that's what I have. Okay, so I know you've been waiting patiently <laughs> to get the <laughs> microphone to the back of the room. <laughs> that's okay. Um, hi, my name is Manfred. I'm a Trino maintainer, so that's a large open source project. And I think one thing that I like to think about when, it talk, when it's about viability, I also want to think more about it as a vitality, not like the just surviving, but the thriving as a project. And I think that's very important. And like things that, like we work with a lot of upstream projects because we depend on their JDBC drivers and whatever. And it's extremely frustrating if they have like a, 
a release cycle that's every six months when we or like every year when we release every week and that kind of stuff so that kind of like vitality is really important and also they're like how much do they look at using modern technologies right like we are on a java stack and if someone is on java 8 that's like a dead giveaway that's a dead project even if it's like maintained by some big ass company it's dead for me right like it needs to be modern right <laughs> Very, very well put. <laughs> All right. We are at the end of time, so thank you. Are, were there any last comments? This is, this is great. So I know that everybody is available here. These are the, the metric models, if you haven't figured that out at this point. So feel free to check them out. You can also check us out at uh, chaos.community. Thanks for being here and thanks to our panelists. So let's give them a round of applause.